we will get started. Uh, hi, I'm Chayton, and this is Quentin, and we're two of your TAs, and we're going to teach the lecture today. So just looking back from where we've been the last few weeks, um, we've looked at different types of generative models, and then like in particular, we had looked at VAEs, diff diffusion models, and now we're going to talk about bands. Yeah, so this is just the roadmap for the day. I'm going to spend the first half of the lecture just talking about what these models are and what problem it's trying to solve, and then we'll talk about a new type of training strategy that we use for these type of networks. And then Quentin will hop in and actually talk about the actual math, about how we train them. And then we'll come back and say like where it's used in real life. Yeah, so this is the problem um, from a large collection of images, can a network learn to generate a new portrait? And this problem is interesting when you start to dig into like, what does generating a new portrait mean? And then in, per in particular, what you want is this face that you generate should be from the same distribution as your like set of images. So what this problem is going to turn into and that you'll see is that how can we characterize and learn this distribution of faces? And what does it mean for a face to be in a distribution? That's you know, what we'll try to set the motivations for. Um, yeah, so what are generative adversarial networks? You guys have probably heard about, these are, have heard the name before. Um, <coughs> but yeah, we'll just take this step by step. So the first part is a generative model, which you guys have seen similar things in the past few weeks. Yeah, so let's talk about what Generative models are. So what we've seen in the past were discriminative models where can we uh, calculate the probability y already knowing that x will sh show up. And then that falls under the discriminative, discriminative models. And these are very helpful for like CNNs and for feature ex, ex feature ex, ex extraction as well as primarily for classification tasks. And you guys have also seen some generative models where you learn the joint distrib the joint distribution of x and y. And this is a little bit tougher problem because you must know like how much x and y both show up at the same time in order to, and predict Y itself. And these are the, some of the models you guys have seen in the past few weeks. Yeah, so these are some of the goals of generative models. In particular, we'll only focus on the generation aspect. And note that in evaluation, the two terms of sample quality and sample diversity do matter. And we'll talk about what that actually means in the context of gen generating a face from a collection of training images. Yeah. But so you guys have seen VAEs and then auto regressive models and in you guys' homework, as well as diffusion models from last lecture and Gaussian mixture models, and 
Today's lecture, GANS is the focus. And with that, we want to be able to distinguish how these models operate and what makes them different from one another. So we'll focus on the first point right now, and we'll later move on to a different one. So there are two types of models you can think about, explicit and implicit generative models. Explicit models know the probability of the, of the training samples that sh show. So you can compute the, the exact problem. In the one of the previous slides, it was generative models compute the joint distribution of X and Y. So here you, you, you would already know what the probability of Y is. You just have to make it show up that many times. In implicit models, you can sample from distribution, but you don't necessarily know how much it will show up in comparison to everything else. It's empirical in some sense. And as you can see, um, in the right, the blue is going to look like this function here, but you won't be able to see it until you sample everything. So, GAs and GAMs are implicit generative models. Oh. I think for polls today, we're not doing them on Piazza, so just take a look, think about the answer in that poll. Take like 20, 30 seconds. <laughs> Do we want to want to say? Yeah. Uh, the first one uh, is A. Yeah. And then the second one is B. Yeah. So just as we talked about, discriminative models model the decision boundary, where generative models model the class distribution themselves. Then, in terms of explicit versus implicit, explicit models already have the probability of the samples themselves, where implicit models only let you draw samples, which makes the probability a little bit trickier. Yeah, so this was just the general setup of generative models as a whole. <clears throat> now, to talk about why training GAMS is not as simple as what we've seen in the past. And the insufficiency of like maximizing the log, the log of writing data. And so this kind of falls under what training method can we use to distinguish one generative model from another. So if you recall, the the problem is still generating a new face from a col collection of training images. But what does it mean for us to generate a face in the distribution of the other faces? And we, what we've seen so far is BAEs, where we used a pair of metric model to you know, train the decoder. And then in this, we, we were able to use the log likelihood to bound our estimates. And what we'll see is this is not 
the exact same as for a dam. Yeah, just maximizing the same as minimizing the negative. Um, yeah, any, I guess, issues so far? This is just stuff you guys have seen. But do you guys have any thoughts on like, do you want to throw out ideas of why MLE might not, not work right here? Or if you think it does, that's okay too. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> the actual likelihood of a sample to show up, right? In BAEs, the whole goal is to generate something that was already there in the training. Can we get back what we had started with? Here we want to generate something that's similar to the training, but doesn't have to be exactly what the training data was. This has to be in the distribution of the training input. So likelihood of a sample sh like being there is a little bit difficult to compute with these implicit models. So we don't actually have the likelihood itself. And with VAEs, we, we could use like n the negative log likelihood to get like the bounds on it. But likelihood is not actually related to like the sample quality. And then here's a simple example. Let's consider we have a model that's 1% su super good and 99% like super, super bad. This is going to have high likelihood, what we'll see, but it's going to give us bad samples because most of it's noise. So for very high dim dimensional data, the log, li the log likelihood of this model is going to be very similar to that of like a great model, but we know that 99% of what it's going to give us is noise. Just by doing the math, like you'll see that when the high, when the the data is very high dimensional, the magnitude of this term here is going to be equal to that of this term here. So we'll see that yeah. like likelihood is not as good of an estimate when we want to generate something new. Any questions about that? Just kind of setting the context and motivation for like the next bit. So. And the, the Beast paper, it's a little small here, but you can go to it. It's like a very quick read. And so if you are interested in going a bit deeper into it, that's a good place to start. Yeah. And then one more thing is we could have good samples, but low likelihood. So the likelihood is not actually measuring the quality of the sample itself, like the sample we're trying to generate. And this is just the model might be overfitting the data. So these are just two examples of how likelihood is not re exactly related to the sample quality. So we need a better measure of how to like, because the goal is to get good sample quality and li likelihood is not doing its job to get us there. Yeah, so let's replace this negative log likelihood with the more useful loss, right? This s s diagram on the left is exactly the VAE, but now, Let's, let's say we have some loss function that's like, does it look like a face? And we'll use this over the next like few slides just to talk about like what it means for does it look like a face and how to characterize that. Another poll 
this time. Yeah. Does someone on Zoom want to say answer to <clears throat> the first one? This one is true. Yeah. And what about and so someone else want to say the second one? Or someone here. And then what about the last one? The last one is true also. Yep. So, yeah. Any questions about anything we've talked about so far? Okay. Yeah, so now we'll actually get into a what training again looks like and kind of just walk through the entire process so what we want is a good function that quantifies the meaning of does it look like a face that's all we really need at the end to be able to say how good our generator is making s s s samples. Yeah, so that is what we're talking about. Um, yeah, so just coming back to a previous slide, we, we, we know the generative part of a GAN. We've seen this. Similar to V8, this is the D coder in a VAE. But now, what's the new thing is adversarial training, which we use two networks that try to beat each other out. And this process allows us to then quantify what does it mean to like, does it look like a face? Then deep neural network. So this is kind of GAN's broken apart and what each part represents. Yeah, exactly what I said. The goal is to now model the training data distribution so we can generate new samples. This is exactly like what VAEs is doing, but now we use the, now we have two separate networks, the generator, which you guys have seen, and something called the disc discriminator. And this is what like quantifies our does it look like a does it look like a face? So this is the overarching setup of what a GAN looks like. You have Z as your like latent vector space. You feed that into the generator. And then after the data, after your generator makes its x prime, you then feed both x prime and your real data x into a discriminator. And this is what's going to quantify does it look like a face or not. This is going to tell you the how good your sample quality is for your X prime. Yeah, so this part you guys have seen, it takes latent like noise, or like latent feature space, and this is similar to the decoder in the VAE. And this is the new part that, you know, is related to the adversarial training to quantify sample quality. So looking at the first half, the ge generator produces hopefully realistic X 
from the latent vector z. And we can take z from like a standard Gaussian. And now the goal is you want to generate like pg of x to match the di distribution of the true training data. So the generator doesn't actually take in the training data at all. And then we'll use pgx because it's easier notation as opposed to like px prime of x. Now the dis the discriminator is going to take in this generated x prime and the actual data, and it's going to try to <coughs> classify whether they're the same or not the same. <coughs> and then what we want to do is, as the if we're sitting in the standing in the shoes of the generator, we want to fool the discriminator. We want to make generated samples that are the same or almost the same to the real training data itself. And as the discriminator, we, we, we want to see one generated and one like true and figure out which one is which, or at least tell the difference from one another. And as you'll see is telling this difference between the two is going to help us do better as the generator. So you can kind of put together how the pieces will work. Yeah, so this is kind of the overarching framework of a can. And something to note here is both the generator and discriminator need to be trained with each other. You, you can't just have one and not the other because the whole point of adding the discriminator was to be able to quantify sample quality. So this is going to become, in part, what our loss function is, which might be a little bit odd at first, because like, how can a network be part of the loss? But we'll see how that would work out. Yes, yeah, so this is some notation that we'll use mm -hmm. in the future. Similar n notation to what we've seen, where z is the latent noise, um, p of x, p of g for the distributions, and then capital G, capital D for the generator and disc discriminator itself. And x is our data sample. Yeah, so for training the discriminator itself, this is similar to a binary classification problem that we had. So we can use um, maximum likelihood estimation to, 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 to train this network. And this is fed like real and syn synthetic egg examples. And we want to minimize the classification loss. You guys have seen this. You guys have done this. So we want to maximize log of d for real faces and log of 1 minus d of x prime for synthetic faces. Now the generator. Let's say we have a loss we can take from the discriminator and we can propagate it back to the generator. We'll go into those details in a bit. Let's just say we have that. If we have that, the goal of the generator is then to maximize this discriminator loss. Right? If we can maximize the loss of the discriminator, we're doing our job to fool the discriminator as best as we can. So the discriminator itself is trying to minimize its loss. And we, as the generator, are trying to maximize that minimization. So we want to minimize that 1 minus d of x prime, or 1 minus d 
g of z. That's our goal as the generator. Does that make sense? Yeah, so just to summarize, for the real data, we're trying to m maximize like its class probability. And then for the generated data x prime, we're also trying to maximize its class probability. That's just the job of the discriminator with its log with its log likelihood loss. And now the generator is solely trying to minimize the class probability of the generated samples x prime. So it's just trying to minimize this term here. And these two are at odds. One trying to maximize, one trying to minimize. So we have a minimax optimization here. This is the GAN formulation and like what the goal of training is. And just to reiterate, the discriminator wants D of X or the actual data to have class one and the synthetic data to have class zero. And the generator wants to make outputs such that the, syn the synthetic data also has class one. Any questions about that? Okay. And on Zoom, like, feel free to either like, put in the chat or just ask a question. Okay. Yeah, so we can kind of see that the training process of GANs will be some sort of balancing act, right? We have to train both the generator and the discriminator simultaneously, as in like one, af one after the other. But if we overtrain the discriminator or undertrain, we will see some s side effects. If the, dis if the discriminator is undertrained, it won't even know the difference between the real and the syn synthetic. So it's not going to be helpful at all to say, hey, which direction should I move my probability distri distribution such that I can then create like more real synthetic samples and vice versa, actually. If the discriminator is overtrained, then it's going to be so good at saying one versus zero that the generator can't use this local feedback of samples that are on the edge of being like synthetic versus real to Im improve itself. So it needs to learn in parallel with the generator and not be too far ahead or too far behind. Yeah, so if you have a training s sample that the generator um, creates a synthetic version of, and it's like the closest to um, something that's actually there in the training, what you want is the discriminator to get that one wrong. So it knows, oh, let's make improvements here. It'll give us some guide for like which like weights and which things to improve in the generator. So that's why if the discriminator is overtrained, the, there'll be no feedback to then say like how to improve the generator itself. Did that? Can I answer your question? Yeah, so you 
not necessarily overfitting. It's more so just the classification is so the classification is so good that no matter what the g g generator does, it has no effect on fooling the discriminator. Because the goal of the generator is to maximize that classification loss. If that loss can't improve anymore, it's so good, no matter what the generator does, it won't do anything. So that's kind of, it'll just come to a s standstill. So what you want is to kind of train these simultaneously, such that one is not, so the disc discriminator is not too far in front or behind of the generator. And we'll also see that in re recitation on Friday, um, like just the problems of training GANs. Uh, so how do we define that is a different from the uh, of the Say we should train it to be comparable to the generator. Yeah, and we'll actually talk about that in like okay. one slide from now. Um, yeah, uh, I guess one point to note is once the generator is able to fool the discriminator, the discriminator is going to roughly output randomness, as in it's going to be like. 50% as synthetic, 50% as like real, but it won't know which is which. And at this point, you no longer need the discriminator. As the generator has learned everything it needs to, to be able to create samples that like look like a face. So we don't need it after generator convergence. Just exactly to what you had asked. This is how we would train a GAN. This, as the first step, we pass like our samples through the generator and then the discriminator. We can compute the loss of the discriminator as L sub D. This loss can then get passed back to the generator with its gradients, and it updates all the discriminator parameters. So this first part here is solely training the discriminator. You can note that we can do this for more than one step at a time. In a single epoch, we can train the discriminator like three or four times and then move on. After we train the discriminator, we then move on to the generator. And here, all we care about is, uh, yeah, all we care about is you know, maximizing that classification loss and using the gradients to then update the generator itself. Any questions about kind of like the rough pseudocode of this? It's essentially just breaking apart training into two separate parts. This is the adversarial nature of the training itself. Propagating the gradient from the generator to the it's discriminator back to the generator. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The the discriminator gets its loss solely from how well the generator does in creating samples, right? So. In the shoes of the discriminator, it's just a classification problem. And that's how its gradients get passed back. The generator then needs 
to use the discriminator itself as a metric to compute sample quality. Was there, there was a one more question, I think. Okay. Yeah. Wait, why is there an uh, interloop between the discriminator and not discriminator? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'll see that in in, in the poll. We'll, but yeah, I, I'll just I'll just give the poll and then we can talk about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give you guys one. Okay. <laughs> uh, for two, we just do the script. Yeah, yeah. And then first one would just be two. Yeah. And then why is because to train this loss is more valuable because you can spend a lot of time training your generator, but un unless you know which direction you have to go, it might not be helpful. So you have to have a good way to. Um, you, you have a, some sense of which direction must I take the generator in. And to do that, you have to have a discriminator that's like just as good or slightly better. So it, like you continually improve the generator. So yeah, um, that is like a hyperparameter. I don't know if you guys saw that. Like it is a hyperparameter you can, you can kind of like figure out as you train and figure out based on the data that you have so yeah so what we've done so far we've talked about generative versus discrimin discriminative models explicit versus implicit models and then the insuff insufficiency of MLE to learning GANs and kind of why we need the discriminator in the f first place now we'll actually talk about like how to train them in the math All righty. So we've um, we've talked a bit right about how GANs train, but we haven't yet checked off this box. And the reason for that is just that we want to give a little bit more kind of texture and intuition about kind of what's actually going on when when this training occurs. So let's take a look back to the GAN formulation that we had, and sort of to your question about what's being propagated back. Right, you can kind of see it in this. Um, in this image right here, right, where it's the discriminator is putting out this real or fake, and then a loss is propagated back from there to the generator. So just to give kind of a, a bit of the reasoning on that. Um, but to look at how this actually works, we're going to um, first kind of look at, like, what does an optimal discriminator actually kind of look like? What's it doing? And then get to eventually, um, once we've trained, like, what does the optimal generator look like as well? So. Um, Kind of just for, for like instruction purposes, we're going to um, treat the optimal discriminator uh, as we have so far as this binary classification problem of saying, you know, is it real or um, is it fake, the image that the discriminator is looking at? And so really what a discriminator is looking at is two uh, distributions, whether it's through the kind of like sampling that we've done or just like full distributions, right? And so it, it's helpful to take a second to kind of understand what's going on here. Um, and so as we look at this image, right, we see two kind of normalized distributions, of, you know, approximately the same height. Um, one is distribution over one class, y1. One is over the other, y2, right? And so if we pick a single point on the line, which here is denoted as like big X, right? Um, we can, we can kind of evaluate those uh, distributions and say, at a given point, what's the probability that uh, this observation is coming from the Y1 distribution, right? And what's the probability that it's coming from the Y2 observation? And then based off of that, right, since it's a binary classification problem, we know that it's only going to come from one of those two distributions. And so the actual posterior probability of the given class is going to be uh, this equation that you see on the screen, which is saying that um, the, it's the probability that it came from uh, the yi class over the sum of all the possible, in this case, just two classes that it might have come from. 
Um, so is everyone clear on that general idea? Great. And so uh, you, can, you can actually draw out what this posterior looks like. In this case, we've just, we've kind of arbitrarily selected, um, just saying it's the posterior for the Y2 class. Um, and you can sort of, you know, this is a rough, this is essentially just a hand-drawn thing, so don't look too closely. But um, you can basically see starting far to the left, right, um, there's, there's absolutely no blue, so the probability of blue is just zero. As you start to get closer towards the middle, and actually when they intersect, right, you hit 0.5, and then by the end it's, all, it's entirely blue, right, so it approaches a posterior of one. And actually, so uh, if I were to ask you, the line that we've drawn here, the, the kind of vertical black line that we've drawn, uh, the discriminator is effectively just we're picking a point and saying if it's above this value, we say it's this class. If not, it's the other class, right? And so if we used this vertical line as our discriminator, can I ask you guys, would it be an optimal discriminator? We can start with maybe a simpler question, which is um, to the right of the line, right? What would be the the kind of the output of the discriminator, red or blue? Just red or red. Be blue, right? Um, and so to the left of it, it would be red, right? Correct. And so you can see that there's this a bit of a gap, right, to the left of it where in fact our discriminator would be outputting a, you know, a class of red, right, Y1. But in fact, the blue line is above the red, right? So what you're saying is that basically at that point of intersection between the two distributions would be the optimal for this class. Exactly, yes, yeah, so you, you read my mind. Um, so this is where we have, just like Josh said, this is where the optimal discriminator would be. Um, and so with this, we can, we can kind of define our discriminator right in this way where the notation change here has been that instead of um, kind of an abstract, you know, Y1 class, Y2 class, we can actually bring this back to our GANS formulation and look at the distribution output by the generator versus the true distribution P sub X, right? And um, bring it back to the idea of our generator is trying to distinguish between the kind of real and fake. So, uh, whatever is generated by the generator distribution is trying to differentiate and see how does that compare to the the true distribution of data that we had. Does that make sense to everyone in class and on Zoom? Great. Yes. Cool. Thank you. So then, um, going back to the the training procedure that Jen laid out. Right, it's this kind of iterative and obviously adversarial process that we have going on. And so we can start with our training distribution, which in this case is the blue. This is, this is just kind of a fixed, um, a fixed quantity in our case. Um, and then we have a generator distribution, which in, in our case, right, you start off with the generator that's untrained. So it, in this case, you can see these distributions aren't particularly close, right? And in the instance of or in the problem of image generation, it might just be that the, the images that your generator is creating just look nothing like faces, right? Look nothing like the training distribution that we, we want to model. Um, so we start here, and then the first thing we can do, um, as we laid out, is we fit a discriminator, right? From here, and again, this is like uh, Josh Mann said, this is just you know where those two lines intersect. Um, that's where the, the discriminator is going to go. The next step, right, is for the generator to kind of fool, right, the, the discriminator that's just been fit. And sort of as we, as we just discussed, right, this in some sense is just kind of, for this very simple case, is just shifting 
the generator's distribution uh, updating the parameters, right? You can kind of see the notation here is the parameters of the generator at time step k are the initial ones that um, the discriminator can do the best it's like it's optimal for distinguishing them. And then at uh, step k plus one, right, we've tweaked those parameters such that it's now shifted that distribution over and we'll able to um, have a few more instances where it can fool the discriminator. And so then, again, we just kind of repeat, right? We shift the discriminator over again, and then now we're in this new setting, right? And this just repeats over and over, right? We can do it again, right? We're in the same place, and then that's a bit of a big jump, but again. So then what happens here when we're pretty much fully overlapping, right? Essentially, the two distributions are almost identical, if not completely identical, in the limit, right? And then, um, as Chadden said, what's the best the discriminator can do in this case? It's looking at two distributions that are basically identical. So it'll effectively be random, just kind of flipping a coin and saying, well, it might be this, might, it might be real, it might be fake, right? And at that point, um, there's really nothing to to backpropagate. There's no update for the discriminator to make to do a better job. And so the, the gradients that get passed back will be zero and we'll just stop making updates, right? And so at this point, it's kind of, we have the optimal generator that has basically very well modeled the training distribution that we had to the point that even the optimal discriminator can't do anything but just guess randomly, right? So does that, does that make sense to everyone? Hopefully between the kind of pseudocode, you, you should be able to see the connection, right, between the pseudocode and this training formulation that we had and this sort of this illustration that we've just given. Um, obviously it's a stylized illustration. We'll get into why actually in real life it's not, it's not this simple, right? It's not this smooth just approach to the distribution and then you, you're done, right? It's actually quite a bit more difficult, but just wanna make sure that in this kind of I idealized case, it makes sense to everyone. So everyone on Zoom, good. Yes. Great. All right, so kind of what we just said, um, in this Minimax setup, there is a stationary point that exists, right? Um, once, we, once we have a really good generator, one that's essentially matching the distribution of the training data, um, the discriminator, all it can do is kind of output random values, output 0.5 for each, it's just not sure. Um, and then like we said, the gradients are gonna be flat and then the generator isn't gonna learn anymore and that's kind of when the, the training stops. Um, the part of the difficulty here though, is that the, this is true when you have a really good discriminator paired with a really good generator. It's also true when you just have a terrible discriminator, right? <laughs> so if you start off with a discriminator that just guesses randomly, um, potentially you'll see, <laughs> you'll see the same behavior, right? So that's, that's one thing, and that's why, as we've said, it's important to kind of train the two together, right? The steps have to be made um, one after the other uh, in tandem. Otherwise, right, you might run into this issue of just, you, you just have a, a terrible discriminator. And then it's also worth noting that um, the stationary points might not be stable, right? This de depends on the kind of exact formulation. Um, again, in the stylized example we just gave, we showed this nice smooth approach towards, you know, one distribution approaching the other. Um, but really, you know, it, it might kind of overshoot. It might not be this smooth approach. Um, and then finally, one point is just like a discriminator with enormous capacity can, can still kind of assign this arbitrary large distance to two uh, similar distributions. So getting into some of the benefits of GANs and but then also some of the challenges. Um, so the benefits are that there is, there can be really good performance. It can produce really crisp results. Um, kind of crisper than something like VAEs. 
and that in recent years, even this is kind of outdated by now, but it, as you can see, there's been this progression of um, already like relatively clear to extremely, extremely crisp. So that's why, um, as you'll see a bit later, you'll see that GANs are, are everywhere. However, uh, we do want to emphasize like these are very difficult to train in practice. And so we'll go into a few um, reasons why and things you might see. So the, the first thing to emphasize is this idea of either mode collapse or mode hopping, which is um, you can sort of see it in this visualization where given data that has a bunch of different peaks, right, almost in essentially like a grid pattern, um, again, may just sort of latch on to a subset of those peaks and really only pick those out. So it's, it's maybe correct that it's um, modeling the distributions at those peaks, but it's kind of forgetting about the others, right? And sort of similarly, there's this idea of mode hopping, which is that maybe it just jumps around those different peaks. Um, now, there are certain mitigations you can, uh, you can use for this. Um, we've listed some of them here, but it's a, we still want to kind of raise the issue. Um, next up, we, we sort of skipped over, the, there can also be issues with like low variability diversity and outputs, which we again want to emphasize that that is an, an important part of the evaluation of generative models, is like how diverse the outputs are. Um, but then also want to emphasize this idea of poor gradients as the discriminator gets better, which um, one of the questions sort of gets a little bit at this, right? It was why is the discriminator is getting better? Do we get maybe less information about training the generator? And so just an illustration of that is the, the chart we've put together on screen, which is all it's trying to illustrate here is that you'll see the orange line represents effectively like a very certain or a more certain discriminator than the blue line, right? And that's just based on the kind of smoothness of the, the cutoff, right? The certain one looks much uh, more similar to almost a threshold, right? And in the limit, it will just become uh, essentially like a non-differentiable threshold. But even in the case where it's not just a thresholding function, you can see how the gradients of the certain discriminator are, unless you're right around the point zero, right? They just become flat, and you'll you'll cease to get actual useful information um, the more certain your discriminator becomes. So that's just one thing again, where it's in part because of this adversarial nature and like the the dual the tandem training that you you get maybe kind of this counterintuitive result where the better your discriminator is doing, it also has some drawbacks to it. So we wanted to illustrate that here. All right, so with that, let's take 30 seconds or so for another poll. Does anyone want to take a crack? Maybe we can go to Zoom. So first option, is that a reason a GAN could fail? Zoom, don't be shy. Or in the room, feel free to shout it out. OK, true. Here, let's go in order. Can I call on you for number two? Is that a reason a GAN could fail? Yes. Good. Good. Yep. Great. So there are a lot of ways these could <laughs> fail to train. Um, so it's definitely difficult, but uh, but there's again the the kind of crispness is definitely a benefit if you can get it to to train. Um, great. So now we've kind of gone through how how GANs train in a little bit more detail, and then also some of the benefits and challenges. Um, 
next up, we're going to take a bit of a step back uh, and basically say, you know, so far we've kind of taken for granted the fact that you can't even train these, right? We haven't really talked about much of the specifics. Um, and in particular, we haven't really talked about what even the losses that we're propagating backward. Um, and so with that, we'll pose a question to the room. Uh, are we using KL divergence? And if so, like, are there problems with that? And this may be a bit of an unfair question. I can give you the answer that no, we're actually not going to be using KL divergence. Um, but let's think through maybe some of the issues that we might run into with KL divergence. Um, does anyone have any to throw out? Yep. Not symmetric. Yep. Perfect. Um, and then, so that's the big one. And then maybe another one, right, is if either, uh, in this case, the P or Q distribution uh, assigns zero probability to something, right? Uh, since we're using, there are these ratios in the log, right, you, uh, you get values that just blow up, right? And so, exactly as you said, right, the, the one big issue is that uh, it's not a symmetric uh, metric. Um, and in the, in the case of GANs, you can actually think of this a little bit more specifically in that one will, um, kind of one side of it will sacrifice image quality, one side of it will sac sacrifice image diversity, right? And then, as we said, uh, we run into issues if either P or Q becomes zero. And so, based on this, we're going to bring in this uh, concept called a, a Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is essentially, it's this symmetric alternative to KL diver divergence that also removes this zero issue. Um, and as you can kind of see from the formulation, it's basically splitting it into two pieces. And it, the zero, uh, we only really run into issues if both P and Q are zero, right? And so that removes some of the issues there. Um, just a visualization of like what this symmetry actually looks like. You can see the, essentially the image on your left, it, these are the distributions. In the middle is the KL divergence, which again, you can see each of, depending on whether you're doing P then Q versus Q then P, right? You're gonna get kind of completely different curves. And then you can see how the Jensen-Shannon actually kind of like merges those together. So does that make sense to everyone on Zoom? Okay, we'll assume yes, but just chime in if not. Um, but actually the takeaway I want you guys to have is that in this case, the the use of the Jensen-Shannon divergence isn't so much um, a convenience we take. It's actually a result of like a, a slightly more fundamental assumption that we're making, which is that when we're going to compare um, the distributions output by the generator versus the dis, uh, the discriminator, or sorry, the um, the true data, the training data, that we're going to make that comparison kind of in the form of a ratio of those, uh, effectively the density functions, right? So it's not just it, you as a researcher saying oh, well, I want to use Jensen-Shannon versus KL. It's that you're saying, I want to compare these two distributions using a ratio. And then what we'll see in a couple of slides is that Jensen-Shannon actually emerges out of that, which is kind of interesting. Yes, and much like the Kool-Aid man, it emerges from <laughs> seemingly dense materials. So, <laughs> um, Great, so just to kind of illustrate this and work through it, um, and also just so you have a, a little bit of the math uh, for later in the slides, um, right, we're converting this ratio of density functions into a binary classification problem, and then we can get this optimal discriminator, which is the D star on the right here. Um, then using a binary cross entropy loss for this parameterized discriminator, um, we can formulate this divergence, right, which is just the, the cross entropy loss, and it um, also, it takes in these expectations, right, over the true distribution of data versus the generated distribution of data. 
And you, you can take time to go through the math, but really, again, like the, the punchline here is not so much arithmetic. It's to say that when we sub in the optimal discriminator D star into this equation here, what you actually get out is a divergence that is the Jensen-Shannon divergence um, plus, you know, plus minus a constant, right? And so when you go to, to learn and optimize it, right, it's the fact that the Jensen-Shannon is actually there just somewhat naturally, right? So like we just said, it's a consequence of um, the choice we've actually made here is that we're comparing the ratios, right? But it's good to kind of take a step back and as you go out and kind of read other academic papers, um, the, the takeaways we want you to have here are such that you can read those papers and not just kind of again understand the math or the arithmetic going on but understand like what are the decisions that the researchers are making versus what are the, the more inherent pieces of the learning paradigm that we have. And so the learning paradigm is this learning by comparison, right? We're comparing a generated distribution to uh, the training data. Um, but what is a little bit more of a choice, right, is whether to look at, um, as we have so far, look at the ratios of distributions versus, say, a, comp a comparison of the kind of differences, like, um, like summing differences between them. The other um, sort of decision, design decision that we've made here is we've largely assumed this kind of zero-sum adversarial structure, um, but this actually doesn't totally need to be the case. And we've actually seen, we'll, we'll bring it back up, but we've actually seen an example where uh, moving away from the zero-sum formulation actually provides some benefit. So let's focus on the first one first. Um, again, we've, we've looked at ratios so far, right? Ratios of density functions. This is what we just did. Um, there's also things called F divergences, which is kind of a similar idea, but again, it's, it still falls under the, or in the ratio bucket. Um, an issue here is that you, when you use ratios, you get poor behavior when the generator and training distributions don't overlap. Um, and that should sort of make a bit of sense intuitively. We'll, we'll go into a bit of why, but even just thinking back to, right, Jensen Shannon uses KL divergences that uses ratios of distributions to each other. And so when there's no overlap between them, you start to get uh, right, zeros emerge and ratios blow up, right? So, but a little more specifically, we said that Jensen-Shannon resolves the issue of when one distribution assigns zero probability to something. Um, but it resolves it in the sense that we just don't get infinities in our ratios. What it doesn't help with is providing actual um, useful information about how different two distributions might be when they don't overlap at all. And so we put this chart together just to, to illustrate this, where if you do have two overlapping distributions, um, you get a, a, a useful value for the, the JSD, which hopefully you, can, yeah, hopefully you can see. But in the bottom two examples, <clears throat> what you can see is that uh, these two distributions don't overlap really at all but they don't overlap at all to different extents, right? You would like to be able to have some sense of the fact that the bottom blue distribution is much farther away um, from the, the orange kind of training data distribution than is the middle one, right? But if you actually calculate it, the Jensen-Shannon divergence you get is just log two no matter what when there's no overlap. And so the metric doesn't really give us any any useful information there. I mean, this is very similar to a previous problem you guys have seen when we first talked about activation functions and why a threshold activation was not enough. Because right? it didn't tell you which direction you should. In a similar way, JSD, when the two distributions are far apart, gives you no information of how, how you should. This is another challenge of training GANs with 
JSD as your like class function. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and in particular, right, when you're starting with a potentially a, a terrible generator, right, you can imagine how this is, this could be a big issue, right? Because if the two can, if they're just, if your generator distribution and your true distribution are just sort of like feeling around in the dark for each other but are actually miles away, right, that there's no point to, <laughs> to spend and compute on that. So, um, so this is a potential issue. So one, uh, one strategy, as we've sort of alluded to, to, to help with this is to use differences to compare distributions rather than ratios. And the one we'll go into a little bit of depth on is this thing called a Wasserstein distance. Um, and there's a, a paper that you can go and read about Wasserstein GANs, which basically replaces this use of ratios for comparison with um, effectively like an integral probability metric, which is just using a difference. And this introduces kind of a, a smoothness to the, the gradients and a bit more information. So going into Wasserstein GAN, um, this, this distance metric that they use is, is called sometimes earth movers distance or optimal trans, uh, transport distance. <clears throat> and it's just this, at a high level, it's this idea of, you know, if you have a certain amount of density on one hand and a certain amount of density in another, um, kind of how much distance do you need to cover to, uh, to move all of that density to overlap with the other. And so the math is a little slightly not pretty to look at, but um, we, we've provided just a few explanations of what's actually going on here. Um, you, you can, for our purposes, you can kind of replace the inf in your mind with just a, a minimum. And then this gamma, it might just be helpful to put this up. This gamma is just a mapping of positions where you're trying to move something from to where you're trying to move it to. Um, so, and then, right, we're just trying to look at the distance between points. So what you can um, read here is basically, you, you can effectively read it as like, you use this mapping, you take, say, the difference between the position 10 and the position one, right? And if there are two, so that's a distance of nine, right? And if there are two blocks you need to move, right, you get two times nine. And you can kind of go through. This, this is a very simplified version of like earth movers distance. Similar, you know, nine minus three is six, and there are two sixes. So it's a little bit of a weird, it's not the best way to present it here, but that's effectively what's going on. And that's what we're gonna use to compare distributions. Um, the issue is that this tends to be kind of intractable. You, for instance, you may not have access to all of the pieces that you need here. And in particular, the gamma can be a very complicated uh, thing. So what we're gonna go through is uh, at a very high level, again, the, the point here, what we want you to take away is not so much all the specific specifics of how to do this. Um, if you do want to go into those, we've provided just a link to a resource that's pretty solid. Um, but just the, the fact that you can, even though this problem is intractable, uh, you, you actually can make some assumptions and simplifications that, that make it a workable problem. And the steps um, are effectively using an inequality to simplify things, um, finding something called a one Lipschitz function uh, that uses actually a network kind of similar to a discriminator, which is typically called a critic, um, and then for enforcing something called the, the Lipschitz constraint, which we won't go into here, but effectively, um, this is actually, if you wanted to look into it, maybe there's been some so better solution to it, but the authors of this paper even acknowledge that their method of enforcing this constraint, uh, in their words, is a clearly a terrible way to do it, and so maybe you can, maybe you can publish something if there's a better way to, that you can find. But again, the punchline is just that um, in the face of this problem, we actually do have a solution to it. And just as an illustration of the, the Wasserstein GAN, you can actually see, this is <clears throat> a figure from the paper, that whereas the red line, which is the typical GAN discriminator, um, has vanishing gradients, um, 
when you do the Wasserstein GAN formulation and use that critic, you actually get informative gradients. So this is this is kind of the benefit of all those steps that you you can dive into a bit more if you'd like. So then quickly going back to the the kind of design decisions we're making, we we also mentioned this zero sum adversarial structure. And so going back to our learning objective, right? The as you can see on the right hand side of this highlighted portion, um, according to this, right, the dis the uh, let's see, the generator, right, is trying to minimize the probability of the discriminator discriminator labeling its output as fake, right? And in that sense, it is this kind of zero sum tug of war game. Um, but that's not some fixed you know, law that you need to have, right? You, it would be just as intuitive to, say, maximize the probability of the discriminator classifying its examples as real. Um, and this is called a, a non-saturating loss. And it, it is sort of a subtle difference. Like, you, Im your immediate reaction may be, like, that still seems kind of zero sum. Um, but in reality, like, what happens that it, is that it actually kind of has better gradients early in training when the generator is very poor. Um, so it's, a, it's potentially an interesting design decision to make. And then you can still kind of recover the zero sum formulation um, if you want from, from this. And the example that we saw is actually in this code, this note we provided here of saying, in practice, this thing saturates early, and we can instead maximize the log of this instead, right? That's exactly this idea that we just brought up. So in fact, in the original paper, they, um, they even kind of walk outside of this zero-sum formulation. All right. And so yeah, at that point, or at this point, we've, we've basically covered all the conceptual things. We're just going to give a few examples. Do you want to do it? I think um, the point of this final section is just to give you a, a couple instances of variants of GANs. Um, but really, the, if, if you want to have a good understanding of them, just like go read the papers. We have the citations uh, in the bottom. Um, but just to give you a, a little bit of flavor, uh, we can go through, for instance, cycle GAN. Um, is, is used for the task of image translation. So a kind of nice one is this idea of, let's say if you have pictures of zebras and want to make them horses, let's, let's throw a GAN at that. And, um, and the big idea here is just that it's not enough to just make things look like horses. You need to retain enough about the original zebras such that you could kind of go back and forth between zebras and horses. Um, and this, that's sort of the, the cyclical nature. So basically, you're keeping enough of the original that it can be retrie retrieved using a second generator. Um, Stargan is basically, again, it's an image translation task where you can, it helps to kind of learn mappings across multiple domains with a single generator. So it, it sort of simplifies rather than using a thousand, you know a bunch of generators uh, to kind of translate between different concepts, um, they formulate a way to, to use a single one. And then this one in particular is an ex extension of cycle game. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas cycle game was just back and forth to now it's like much more. I kind of see how this is a lot more powerful for generating many different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like, again, the, really the, the takeaway we want you to have is to understand from this lecture is to understand the pieces of the, the kind of vanilla GAN enough such that you can just start to have some fun yourselves and just like piece them together in, in interesting ways. And so this is a nice example of that. Um, there's also this concept of <clears throat> conditional GANs, which is just the idea that you might want to bring some other uh, basically covariates uh, some additional information into the equation and then uh, train again using that information as well. <laughs> and then finally, uh, bigans uh, is just this idea of kind of mapping. It, instead of going from latent space to feature space, 
if we go from feature space to latent space and the authors basically find that there's some some actual use in that kind of even going back to um, discriminative problems. Um, so that's an interesting finding as well. And so with that, I think we have uh, we've gone through pretty much everything. So yeah, feel free to check out some of the sources that we list. In particular, this I talked to you about this. Channel. This Murphy book is awesome. Just like it's online, you can open up to any page. Fantastic. You'll see a lot of our lecture in that. So um, definitely check it out. But yeah, any questions? And then just to plug, presentation on Friday will actually train us in Google Camp. So you guys can like actually see what this train plus looks like and the insta the instability issues that we talked about. All right, well, thank you all. All good on Zoom? All right, so we talked. <laughs> all right, thank you, guys. I'm surprised it was weird.